Recently I took the dog for a walk down Yarraband Road, Fairfield. We strolled past the Melbourne Polytechnic, which is the fancy new name for the Northern Institute of TAFE, and the Thomas M. Ling Hospital for the Criminally Insane, before reaching a grassy field where a hot air balloon was landing. Had we traced that same path in 1984, the year that Suzanne and I first met, we would have passed the well-guarded gates of Fairfield Infectious Diseases Hospital, a leprosarium, and the grim granite walls of Fairly Women's Prison. Now gone, like Bogart and McCall and black and white movies. Suzanne, who had trained as a laboratory scientist before studying medicine at Monash, arrived at Fairfield Hospital in the summer of 1984 as one of a small group of registrars. She immediately made a mark, not just because with Annie Mitch, Jenny Hui and Ben Biggs, she dramatically altered the gender balance on the campus, because she was smart, energetic and effervescent. At that time, Melbourne's leading football commentator was Norman Banks, whose Saturday broadcasts were sponsored by a soft drinks company, which required him to constantly extol the superiority of the bubbles in their tonic water. And it was obvious that Suzanne's were not ordinary bubbles. Suzanne had schweppervescence. <laughs> she started her career in infectious diseases at Fairfield and to some extent never left. For as I hope to show you, while you can take the girl out of Fairfield, you can't take Fairfield out of the girl. 1984 was an extraordinary time to be entering the field of infectious diseases and Fairfield a fascinating place to be. The hospital consisted of a series of old Nightingale pavilions linked by covered walkways to several more modern wards, all set in vast gardens. In the 1960s and 70s, the long-serving medical superintendent John Forbes and matron Vivian Bullwinkle, both of whom were World War II veterans, lived on site, where they sought to recreate the sense of teamwork and camaraderie that they both found in uniform. They treated the permanent staff as part of their extended families, gave them a great deal of responsibility, treated them like adults and backed them to the hilt, creating an ethos that the hospital never lost. John believed that good medical practice should be informed by research, and encourages staff to pursue their interests. The unpredictable nature of work in a hospital designed to cope with outbreaks of disease meant that during quiet periods, the clinical laboratory staff were free to undertake research, write books, play sport, or engage in dalliances. <laughs> Alvis Cusis created the monumental work on microbi antimicrobials, which under the guidance of Lindsay Grayson with the assistance of both Suzanne and John is now in its sixth edition and widely regarded as the most authoritative work in the field. For many years, the medical staff dined in a dedicated room, had access to a private lounge with splendid old leather couches for morning and afternoon tea. And in the days before email, it was a marvellous way of encouraging communication. Most charming of all, about 12.30 every day, a call would go over the public address system reminding the senior medical staff that it was time for quiet practice. A brief meeting in the medical superintendent's office to review the affairs of the day, followed by a glass of dry sherry in his sitting room before lunch. In 1984, that bucolic tranquility was shattered not just by the arrival of Suzanne, but by the arrival of AIDS. When the first cases were diagnosed in 82 and 83, there was an outbreak of fear which, stoked by the tabloid press, created a level of hysteria in the community, but also in sections of the medical profession. And the state government was very easily persuaded that the safest place to care for patients was an institution with special skills in handling patients with infectious diseases, so Fairfield was designated as the state's primary AIDS facility. And Ron Lucas, Anne Mitch, Murray Sandler and Suzanne 
Jenny and Bev became involved in establishing the necessary inpatient and outpatient services. They did a superb job creating a world-class service which was professional, supportive, non-judgmental and highly valued by the patients and their friends. I think it's hard to describe the early days of the AIDS epidemic to anyone who wasn't actually involved, especially as today's experience is so radically different. There were no specific antiviral drugs, limited options for treating severe opportunistic infections, so that a diagnosis of HIV infection was essentially a death sentence. The patients, who were usually young men of a similar age as staff, were admitted to hospital with a series of increasingly severe infections of their vital organs and mucosal surfaces, often becoming blind or demented. Because of the amount of time that they spent in hospital, and the fact that they were often estranged from their families, they became close to the doctors and nurses so that every death felt like a death in the family. It was a difficult time for the clinician who worked long hours under great strain. Not everyone was able to cope, and those like Suzanne who did showed remarkable resilience and compassion. In addition to patient care, the medical staff became trusted advisors to the affected communities, providers of advice to the, to the community and the government. It was an exciting, exhausting, demanding period in which all of us learnt the value of close links to bodies like WHO and CDC, how to establish new services from ground up, how to become involved in policy making and argue for resources, and how to communicate with the public in terms that were easily understood, skills which have served Suzanne well ever since. In the two years that Suzanne was at Fairfield before she headed to California to complete her training, the hospital not only housed a significant number of AIDS patients, but had developed in-house diagnostic assays which made it possible to begin to study the epidemiology and natural history of the disease. And Suzanne began to spend more time in the laboratory, writing several papers and providing the first signs of the clinician scientist she was to become. Shortly after she left for the States, the hospital's research unit was renamed and formally launched as the Burnett Institute, and a public appeal was conducted to raise funds to enable us to recruit several senior scientists and provide them with some job security whilst they established themselves as independent investigators. Suzanne was the first person appointed to one of those roles, returning to Fairfield in December 1988. She became the Institute's first, youngest and now longest serving and arguably most influential unit head as Gus said, has seen the Institute grow dramatically over the last 30 years. Suzanne devoted herself to the study of HIV pathogenesis, especially the role of macrophages and monocytes, and has become an international authority in the field. And again, as you've heard, with David Anderson, she's recently added an extra string to her bow by developing a group of low-cost point-of-care diagnostic tests which have got the potential to transform the management of many infectious diseases in the developing world. Although we've not actually worked together since 1990, our paths have continued across both professionally and socially, and I've watched with delight as Suzanne's stature has grown and she's become a mentor and role model for generations of young scientists at the Burnett and beyond and inculcated them with the Fairfield ethos. Suzanne, it's been a delight to be your colleague and friend these many years and to see your friend, your career, and the institute to which you've contributed so much flourish. Thank you to you and John for enriching my life, and may you never lose your short of essence. Thank you.